Yeah, all right. So, hey, Patrick. So, I'm Austin. I'm an incoming freshman at UC Berkeley, and I've been in Hack Club for about a year now. I actually joined because of Teen XLI, which is a high school hackathon that I run in New York. And so, Patrick Allison, our guest, is the co-founder of Stripe, among being a huge reader and a huge science nerd. So, for those of you who don't know, Stripe, as my shirt is here, is an online payment platform that processes billions of dollars every single year. And at least for me, I have a huge respect for Patrick because um, a lot of entrepreneurs and like a lot of us, when we go to hackathons, we always try and find like that one niche that like no one's gone for. It's like the next emerging industry. But he saw something that was years on end that's already been filled up with all these legacy systems and old guys. And he's like, I'm going to find the new way to take it on and make a difference. And I thought that was like super cool and definitely super risky. Um, and with Patrick and Stripe, what they do like super differently is um, they definitely are very close to community, like the, the dev community specifically with their audience. And so whether that's like running fun competitions or like investing in like indie hackers, there's always like a huge focus you can see where it's not necessarily just about the product. Um, and I think that's something that really resonates with us like hack clubbers that you're on the call with now, Patrick, because like we're all high school coders like across the world in Egypt and India and America. And we just like coming to get, get together for these kinds of events. Um, so we're super happy to have you here. And um, yeah, without further ado, did you want to share like a quick story as we get into it? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, what um, uh, Zach just spoke about and, and you know, what you're speaking about really resonates where uh, I think that um, uh, you know, years in, uh, in high school or sort of you know, that period of your life, uh, you, can, you can really do a tremendous amount. Uh, and certainly I found that uh, you know, the, <laughs> the world doesn't really kind of expect you to in some way, like, you, you know, you're, you're sort of adolescence, you're, you're still seen as, um, uh, you know, very much the uh, sort of a receptacle into, you know, which knowledge uh, uh, ought to be poured. Uh, and, uh, you know, to the extent that one does projects, uh, they're, they're sort of always um, kind of, uh, you know, simulacrums or, or, or kind of um, uh, imitations of the kind of real projects that adults do. Uh, and so I think the mentality of Hack Club that, you know, teenagers or, or people in school are actually capable of doing the real thing uh, is, uh, is exactly the right one. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that was a real kind of epiphany for me where, uh, you know, when I was um, you know, 15 or 16 uh, and starting to kind of really pursue programming seriously, uh, kind of realizing that it's not that I was great at it, but that kind of I, I could in some sense do it in the same way that uh, sort of, you know, a real adult could uh, was, uh, was a very big deal. Aww. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I think like especially for us too. Like we have, of course, like our regular like CS classes in our school. But like on some ex extent, like as you're saying, it sort of feels like cookie cutter. Like you know, that's what oh we're doing in the next step before we become like a real programmer. But like right. as you start at 16, like it's very cool. Like we can actually get involved right now. Um, yeah. So we're gonna turn over to some of the hat clubbers now. Uh, as you guys come up, you can unmute yourself, turn on your camera. Um, yeah, make sure to you know say your name, where you're from. Uh, your age. And so, yeah, the first question from Dina, you want to take it away? Hi. Um, I just want to start off by saying it's awesome to be talking to you, Patrick. Um, your love for the environment and your company itself is really inspiring. Uh, so I'm 18. I lead a hack club um, in Milton, Ontario, Canada. And I joined the Hack Club community two years ago and a big focus in our club is cybersecurity. Um, so Stripe is very open about your, uh, cyber, your security practices and encourages pen testing through rewards. Could you share some criticisms you've had for this decision and your experience with the benefits of having this type of system? Um. We haven't received a whole lot of. Well, first off, it's lovely to meet you, and uh, it's 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 awesome that you're um, you're running this hack club. Um, uh, we, we haven't gotten a lot of criticism uh, for sort of that practice of, uh, of kind of inviting disclosure and uh, and paying rewards. Uh, honestly, as a practical matter, the biggest issue we faced uh, is we get a lot of low quality submissions, uh, and there's just like a lot of work involved in sort of going through all of them, deciding sort of which you know are kind of you know real issues, which are actually expected behavior. Uh, and you know, obviously, as you know, uh, with security issues, you know, they're often pretty complicated. And so, like the the act of assessing is, is itself, you know, not always trivial. Um, and then also by sort of awarding um, uh, rewards, then that also means that we often have to, you know, decide to not award an award because for whatever reason it doesn't meet our eligibility criteria. Uh, and that means you're, you're kind of giving someone some bad news that you know 
from their vantage point, they did all this work, and now we're telling them that we're, we're not actually paying out sort of for whatever reason, uh, and you know that, that that's obviously not well, generally not what they're sort of uh, uh, eager to hear. Um, and so I think the, the kind of operational cost and sort of having to, in a sense, systematically dis disappoint people is probably the biggest downside. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess the thing obviously we're optimizing for is uh, how do we, um, you know, it's not the feelings of any party, ourselves or others, but rather just uh, what kind of creates the most security for our user base over time, because we just feel a really strong custodial responsibility to them. Uh, and kind of, we want to act in accordance with the framework that you know, they would wish uh, that, uh, that you know, we, we operated by. Uh, and so that's what the guys are thinking. Very cool. I think that's kind of cool because like it shows like you're definitely like very close to the customer itself. It's not like pie in the sky, like you're handing down to them. It's like really getting them involved. So. No, I mean, we, uh, Stripe's first Stripe is a whole set of operating principles, uh, that, which is kind of a distillation of, uh, you know, we, we try to kind of reverse engineer you know, what worked well and sort of which behaviors should we try to continue. And, you know, to be clear, uh, you know, when we were starting out, we didn't really know which things we did were kind of good or bad or effective or ineffective. But after a couple of years, we started to kind of develop some amount of, you know, understanding or, or sort of hypotheses. Uh, and so we try to codify that uh, in our operating principles. And it's not like some sort of frozen uh, document uh, or, or, or cast in stone. You know, we, we do update and revise it as we learn more about how we think we should work or what we should aspire to. Anyway, uh, our, our first operating principle is users first. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, um, everyone always talks about the importance of metrics and metrics are, I think, you know, very important, but there's a lot of um, sort of a, a dimensionality reduction that happens in metrics. And like in a metric, it's kind of a lot that's going on where, you're uh, you're measuring you know a, a particular thing in a kind of you know with a single you know me um, measurement methodology uh, and you're collapsing like a very complicated world into you know a, a generally speaking kind of a single uh, univariate time series uh, and so there's a lot that's lost there uh, and uh, and so well obviously yes metrics are very important I think that people you know as soon as they realize that often tend to then underweight the qualitative stuff. And you just, you don't, you don't even necessarily know what you're learning uh, you know, when, you, when you talk to users or when you talk to customers, but you're, you're improving your kind of mental ability to you know, simulate their instincts. Uh, you're uh, you're you know, learning a bit about you know, what they care more and less about and so on. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of kind of qualitative thinking, uh, which I think is often sort of, at least in Silicon Valley, uh, comparatively under, uh, underemphasized. Yeah, I think more companies should take on that mindset too, because it's definitely very productive. Um, I have like a quick question to jump in, like sort of like you from like your early life. Um, could you share like maybe your like your first hack uh, as like a teenager in Ireland? <laughs> yeah, um, the first thing I remember writing was well, everyone here is probably too young. Did I ever use MSN Messenger? I did. <laughs> okay, great. Um, at least yeah, yes. a few people. Uh, so I think it's now discontinued, but, um, uh, but, uh, I, I wrote a, um, uh, one, of, one of the first programs I ever wrote was a, a program to, uh, to just kind of reverse engineer the MSN messenger protocol so that I could write bots, uh, and then use this. Uh, and then I wrote a little bot called Isaac, um, after Isaac Asimov, whose work I really liked, uh, that you could, um, that you could, you know, talk to, uh, and there I sort of started getting interested in AI and, um, I was very kind of naive in that, you know, I read about it and, you know, discovered the Turing test and you know, obviously a lot of people have you know, worked very hard on, on building kind of bots that work. And I was like, well, you know, maybe I'll, you know, it's kind of, okay, now that I've implemented the MSN Messenger protocol, now I just have to implement an AI and, you know, how hard could that be? Uh, and so, you know, after a while I realized that, hmm, this, this is probably, you know, not quite, you know, the, the step two project to take on. Uh, but uh, anyway, this, this uh, MSN Messenger protocol was one of the first things I ever wrote. Cool, yeah. It's actually yeah, everyone in Hack Club. We're all in a Slack too. We're all making like Slack bots and like trying to create little protocols like that too. So yeah, well, it's, 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 they're, they're fun because uh, obviously you get to sort of. Um, I mean, yeah, like I, I, I think PHP is actually a really good language to uh, start out with because uh, it's just very easy to build things you can show your friends. Uh, and you know, at least for me, a non-trivial part of the motivation was to you know share things with you know the friends I knew who who were also also interested in programming. Um, and, uh, and bots, of course, also have that characteristic. It's like, you know, there's a, a good UI for friends to interact. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to hand it over to Matt. You want to ask Patrick a question? 
Hey, Patrick. Um, I'm Matthew Gleish, a 16-year-old hack clubber from New Hampshire. Um, and I was wondering how having a rich API and amazing developer relations um, accelerate customer adoption. Sure. Um, well, I don't know if anyone will take me seriously after uh, advocating for PHP, but um, uh, I mean, we often talk internally about um, the archetype of the impatient developer. Uh, and it's not necessarily so much, I mean, you, yeah, we, we do try to have an experience that's like super polished and nicely designed and all of that. But the main thing we're going for is just, this is an impatient developer who, you know, they didn't come to Stripe to, you know, experience Stripe's, you know, wondrous particulars. They came to Stripe because they're doing something else. Uh, and kind of as part of that, they want to be able to, you know, get paid. Uh, and a lot of it is just trying to make you know, that process as efficient as possible. And it's you know, like... Folks at Google sometimes talk about sort of a success metric for Google is getting you off Google as quickly as possible and, and you know, connecting you to to you know the, the relevant search results. And kind of similarly for us, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to kind of time to integration or time to first payment or whatever. Uh, and you know, in a sense, the goal is, is is to reduce that and make people use as little of Stripe uh, as possible in some sense. Um, and in that, a lot of it is just trying to pay attention to the you know the, the, the micro frictions. Uh, in that, um, you know, <laughs> um, you can, uh, an example we often use, uh, is, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you're giving so an example shell prompt, uh, like it isn't, you think a very basic thing to do is you're going to give some sort of sample code, right? Uh, like a, a little sample snippet. Uh, well, okay. Uh, that sample snippet probably depends on some library being available. And so you probably want to, you know, first just show kind of how to install the library with like a, a snippet that you can really easily copy and paste. Um, uh, so that you, know, you actually have the relevant library. Then when you're going to run the snippet, uh, you know, you probably need some kind of authentication token or API key or whatever. And so it's, you know, okay, well, you know, where do you go to get that? And of course, you know, to save you having to go spelunk around in your account settings, whatever, we try to embed that token, the actual token from your account directly there in the docs to kind of save you around trip. Um, but then when we're showing the snippet, you know, usually there's like a prompt of some sort, like the, um, the, the, the you know, command you're going to run, and then maybe you, you show the example output. If you just do that in HTML kind of naively, you know, maybe you show some, you know, some kind of initial you know, dollar symbol or, 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 or bracket or you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, and then if you copy and paste that, it like copies the, the prompt. But that's not what you want. And so you should render the prompt in CSS. Uh, so when you copy it, you're only copying the prompt itself. Anyway, that's obviously like a tiny detail. We're saving people from like having to you know strip out one character or whatever. But I think a lot of it is kind of just taking that sort of mindset to the whole process so that you know somebody can come to Stripe and with as sort of that and has to learn as few mental models as possible in order to sort of get from being on our website to actually having accepted their their first payment or indeed be, being kind of up and running. But basically, we're not trying to impress in a sense. We're just trying to be efficient and, and recognize that our users are impatient. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, our next question comes from Alex K. I'm going to take it away. Hi, I'm Alex Kessin. I'm a high school sophomore from New York. My question is, um, if you weren't running Stripe right now, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, man. Um, hmm. I mean, uh, well, there's a lot of interesting... Um, well, I, I don't know, but, but but more because there there are so many things that are interesting rather than you know it's it's hard to think of an interesting thing uh, in that um, like well I'm super interested in sort of science and, and economic development and the feedback loops between those and but whatever you know that that's its whole other area but 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 maybe something pertaining to them uh, you know there's there's this line from uh, from Robert Lucas the economist that sort of as soon as you start to think about questions you know related to economic development it's kind of hard to think about anything else. And there is kind of a sense in which that's true uh, in that, you know, as we look around the world, and I mean, I experienced this very viscerally growing up in Ireland, you know, in my parents' generation in Ireland, Ireland was a pretty poor country. And then like just a generation later, by the time I was growing up there, Ireland was way richer. In fact, one of the richer countries in Europe. And so you're like, man, you know, what happened there? And, and this has sort of such enormous consequences, you know, not only for my life, but for you know, the lives of everyone, uh, that sort of figuring out what the set of, you know, interventions are that work seems like it's just an incredibly big deal, right? And so yeah, I think a lot of those questions are really interesting. And um, kind of similarly, you know, if you really zoom out and, and, and look at the world on a kind of multi, you know, century timescale, um, arguably the first order question, well, maybe the first order question is, you know, do we destroy ourselves or not? Or, you know, do we do something that kind of massively sets us back? 
And if you set that aside, then it's, well, okay, how much kind of scientific and technological progress do we make? Because, you know, that's what sort of enables us to advance beyond uh, subsistence farming. And so anyway, I think kind of, you know, how does the process of science work? You know, what determines how quickly we're making this progress? I think all those questions are really interesting. But to give a kind of concrete answer, um, like, uh, I think that developer tools uh, are, are, are still incredibly antiquated and sort of um, slow and inefficient. Uh, and you know, when, when I was a teenager, I learned um, uh, I learned uh, um, well Lisp very early on, and then you know when I was eighteen or nineteen, I learned Smalltalk, uh, and then maybe when I was twenty-ish, uh, maybe I was nineteen, uh, I learned Mathematica. Um, and all of those environments are uh, are, are um, like in, in different ways, they're just so much more advanced uh, than, uh, than what we have access to today. Like if you use a Lisp, uh, a Lisp machine, if they wrote this whole operating system in Lisp, you can modify the code of any running application at runtime. You don't have to like recompile the whole system. You don't have to go download the source code. You don't have to like solve all these build errors. You can just like hop in, make a quick change, done, right? Um, and uh, and so I often, I mean, I don't know, I don't know if this would be a good business, but I often think about like, why in some way did we have a better development environment in 1980 uh, than, uh, than we have today in 2020? And if you think that software is going to be super important for the world over the next you know, 80 years, which I do, um, isn't that a pretty important problem? <laughs> I think definitely so. I think especially because um, we always look, look to the future. It's like, oh, like the next generation of like tech. It's like all these other questions about like philosophy and economics are going to be just as important as we go into that next chapter. So it's definitely cool to hear those perspectives as well. Um, we're going to turn it over to Snigda. You want to ask Patrick a question? Hey, Patrick. Um, I'm a high schooler in New York. Um, I really love the work that you're doing with Stripe. Um, oftentimes, they hear that Stripe is a really great place to work at, uh, which is really exciting to hear. Um, but something that I'm really curious about is um, when you were younger, like pre-Stripe years, um, did you feel that, wait, was there anything that you felt that you um, didn't do as well as your peers, like you were a little bit behind on maybe, they excelled at better than you. Um, I would say like maybe like high school, college short-ish years. Did you, did you feel that there was anything like that? Yeah, and um, well, I guess I often felt um, sort of, lost and uncertain. I don't want to overstate it and exaggerate with some kind of, you know, fake sob story and that like ultimately, you know, I was lucky I had a kind of comfortable upbringing and so on. And, but the high school I went to, um, uh, was, uh, it was a public school, but it was quite, quite far away. And so basically just as a 13 year old, when I got there, I knew literally nobody for kind of everyone else, you know, all, they, they all knew each other. And so, I really felt like a, a sort of, or I just was kind of quite an insider there. Um, and, um, uh, you know, my parents wanted me to go there or kind of really worked hard to get me a place there because, you know, they thought it was a better school than the, the ones kind of closer to us. And, and then sort of all through it, uh, I kind of, um, uh, I, was, uh, I was, you know, trying to figure out what I was interested in and um, and lots of things that I was interested in I wasn't necessarily that good at like for a while I really wanted to learn uh, and, and get good at uh, ancient Greek and Latin um, and I spent probably three years in them uh, and honestly I didn't really get that far and uh, I despite three years of study uh, I'm, I'm not good at all at either um, and or and because I was interested in all these other things as well I, I was kind of taking time off classes or, you know, just doing things quite differently to my peers. And so it was kind of, I guess, I came as an other and as an outsider and sort of in a sense that was like compounded with subsequent years. I was like doing those other kind of random things. And there's a sense in hindsight that it all kind of worked out. But I think if you'd kind of looked at me at, you know, age 15 or 17 or, or, or even 20, uh, that it just wasn't clear kind of where all of this was going. Like I think one would have said, you know, talented kid, but, you know, doesn't quite know what he's doing or where he's going. And like, in a sense, that wasn't wrong. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I think I had kind of instincts uh, for, you know, what might end up being, you know, valuable. I'm certainly glad that kind of I now have the experiences that I have had to draw on. Um, and, and I don't honestly even know kind of whether I was following a good strategy or not, right? In that, 
you know, uh, you always want to be cognizant of the sort of survivorship bias. And, you know, maybe, maybe I was kind of playing some kind of life choice lottery and I'm like, yeah, the lottery is great. Uh, and, uh, and I often wonder about that, but, you know, we don't get to see the counterfactuals, but kind of as a direct answer to your question, uh, there was kind of persistent sense of, um, outsideriness. And then there were definitely subjects, um, uh, uh, most notably languages, where I think I was just not particularly talented. Do you well, think I'm really, I'm really in some, in, my parents also did that, where they put me in a school where um, they thought was the best, but then I realized later wasn't quite the best and I could have been somewhere better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I really relate to your story, by the way. Thank you for sharing that. I'm kind of curious. Do you think like it might've been like sort of different if you're growing up now as like a 17 year old, now that it's like sort of more connected online or I think it's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a good question. Look, I, I don't know how uh, how kids these days grow up, so uh, I'm hesitant to uh, uh, kind of render any verdicts. Um, but uh, I, um, definitely, I think be because of where and, and when I guess I grew up, uh, it was fairly easy to be kind of, I guess, to be different. Um, and, and you know, n n none of my friends you know lived. Uh, within sort of certainly walking distance and even a reasonable driving distance of, of our home. And so kind of, you know, after school in the evening, there was kind of nothing really to do other than, you know, read books and, and then over time program. Um, and I sort of, and a lot of my friends, I mean, basically two of my friends were interested in programming and, and nobody else I knew. Uh, and in a sense, that was good because, again, it just, it, it meant that I was kind of free to drift off in sort of whatever directions uh, I kind of wanted. Uh, and so I do think the question of sort of what's the, what's the optimal amount of kind of connection to the rest of the world is an interesting one. Uh, and it may be a case where more is not better. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I really wonder about it because, you know, the flip side is you know, there's so many tremendous opportunities now. And, uh, you know, maybe, um, like it, it, there's always whatever, you shouldn't listen to me too much because it, 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 it's truly, you know, uh, uh these are, these are um, very difficult to compare situations. Uh, and it's very easy for people in general, and, you know, myself included, to try to kind of, uh, you know, sort of ex post justify why the kind of upbringing, you know, one had, you know, presumably you as a human, you know, you're, you're kind of fairly happy with how you turned out you know, in, in just most cases. Uh, and so then you try to sort of construct this narrative uh, as to sort of how it was, you know, uh, um, you're, you're like the puzzle uh, explaining why the hole you're in is perfectly fit to you. Uh, and so, um, uh, uh, I don't know. That's a fair answer. <laughs> yeah. Cause I guess everyone's path is different. Um, yeah, we had a question from, uh, Alishan, if you want to take it away. Yeah. Alishan? My name is Alishan. I'm a former club leader in Southwest Ohio, and I'm actually planning on studying computer science and economics in college next year. Um, so I sort of had a question about the COVID-19 pandemic that's happening right now. Do you think they'll have a major impact on our economy and sort of if it's a verb, e-commerce for rising the rest of our world and pushing us more towards platforms like Stripe? Um, well, I think it's already had a pretty huge effect on the economy and, and you know, obviously the unemployment figures and you know, the U.S. now being in recession and uh, indeed kind of entering recession at kind of a you know, record rate. Um, and, so, um, and, and so I think the main question is, is really kind of, yeah, uh, how quickly uh, it's going to snap back. Uh, and the most recent unemployment figures, uh, for example, suggest that uh, maybe the snapback you know, might be faster than a, you know, sort of one might have expected uh, if one was to kind of compare with past recessions. And you know, you can even imagine sort of a theory as to why that is. For like in past recessions, maybe um, you know, sort of businesses were you know fundamentally unsound, or you know, large swathes of the economy either contracted or, or, or sort of. Uh, uh, you know, saw persistent structural changes, whereas in the case of, uh, of COVID, maybe it's you know, these temporary pauses, and even if technically they had to lay off a whole bunch of people who were kind of per, per um, uh, government statistics unemployed, uh, you know, perhaps the business reopens and kind of just you know, go, go, goes down through you know, the address book and you know, calls everyone up and, uh, and invites them back, right? Uh, and, and again, there is some data to support that in the most recent US uh, uh, unemployment figures. Um, but uh, you know, as, as to kind of how large the effects will be, um, my guess, and you know, I, I think uh, the COVID crisis thus far shows that one should probably lower the kind of 
confidence and, and credence uh, one ascribes to any expert projections uh, or, or putatively uh, sort of uh, informed opinions. And, and just, I think the whole world is, is far more kind of, uh, it's a chaotic emergent system and it's, it's hard to, uh, to, to be too confident in, in, in any forecast. But my, my kind of working model is that, you know, two thirds of the changes will turn out to be temporary, uh, but that one third ish, uh, you know, depending on the 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 the, the area or the question, uh, will, will prove to be a more durable shift. And so, for example, if you take you know a huge swing towards you know online grocery shopping, um, uh, I think that you know a significant fraction of that will of course return. But I suspect also a lot of people will realize, oh hey, this is much more convenient. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is you know not as expensive or as complicated or whatever as I thought, uh, and uh, and uh, that will endure. And a framing that some of my friends and I have, have been sort of discussing is, you know, uh, and, and this is kind of tongue in cheek, but 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 uh, is kind of world 1.0 versus world 2.0. Uh, and I think that's exaggerated. You know, I don't think kind of the COVID crisis is some sort of, you know, truly apocal moment uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, between sort of the before and after. Uh, but um, actually, I was speaking with a friend last night uh, and, you know, as, as a byproduct of, of COVID, they're choosing with their company to go fully remote. Um, and sort of genuinely fully remote in the sense that, um, you know, he has committed to not going to the office uh, more than once a month. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that's a kind of, you know, world 2.0 shift. Uh, and, um, and I think, you know, there's a <laughs> part of what's happening, I think, is that, you know, in, in, um, in normal times, like, Obviously, much of what we do is dictated by the behavior of those around us, right? And so, actually, everyone could have thought, in principle, that it'd be good if uh, you know more of the world sort of worked in a remote fashion. Um, uh, but uh, um, sort of, you're constrained by the expectations and behaviors of others around you. And if you're the only person who's actually acting, uh, then you know, people think you're kind of weird. Maybe it's kind of offensive. It's like, do you not respect me enough to come visit me or spend time with me in person or, you know, whatever. And so I think this is kind of a, a coordination point or a shelling point for a sort of huge you know, global reset of norms uh, in a way that's, uh, that, that's, you know, potentially quite powerful. Yeah. And I, I think definitely what you're saying in terms of like the pandemic showing us that we can't always trust those institutions. It kind of lines up perfectly with like Stripe. Like you can't always put your faith in like the old existing institutions. So it's, I think it definitely proves a lot. Um, yeah, so we are coming around like the halfway point now. So we're gonna try and go through some like lightning round questions. So you guys have some like quick questions and like some quick answers to go through. Right, right, right. That's a polite way of saying you want uh, quick answers. <laughs> no, yeah, we want, we want to hear a, a lot of different things you have to say. So we're gonna take it away to Claire and uh, ask away. Um, hello, so I'm Claire. I'm a high club leader in Los Angeles and I'm a freshman. So I was wondering about what field or hobby that you'd like to pursue if say you had all the time in the world or if you had access to any mentor or teacher since like a lot of us have times on our hands especially now since you can't go uh, to camp or anything i was curious if there was like a hobby or interest like another language maybe greek that you've always wanted to pursue um interesting question um i keep feeling guilty that i don't understand um um a whole bunch of sciences in more detail. Um, and, you know, I, I, I read textbooks sometimes and, you know, they're actually, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, like even kind of college textbooks, they're actually surprisingly readable. And, you know, I, um, uh, back a, a few months ago, I, re I read an immunology textbook and it was actually super interesting. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I, I always feel like I'm not sort of doing as much of that as I should. I was actually very lucky. A, a couple of years ago, I worked with someone um, uh, once a week who, who was teaching me physics because uh, I, I went to uh, I went to college and sort of the goal of becoming a physicist. And you know, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, and you know, physics kind of has these sort of tiers of abstractions. Uh, you know, it's not obviously totally kind of hierarchical. Um, but you know, maybe there's uh, sort of you know basic Newtonian mechanics, uh, and then uh, uh, special relativity and you know, general relativity, and I guess, you know, quantum branches off uh, at some point and so on. And uh, I felt bad that um, I, I kind of got many tiers up the stack, but I'd never properly come to understand general relativity. And so uh, we spent a while uh, uh, with basically him teaching me that. Uh, and then, um, then we sort of went into some kind of modern uh, uh, quantum theory and, and quantum information theory and, and, and field theory. Uh, and uh, I mean, that was awesome. And uh, I'm not doing it at the moment. 
Um, but uh, I, I, I've been actually wondering if I should sort of get back to something like it. My, my partner is a, uh, she's a, a biomedical professor. And so I, I spend a lot of time just kind of asking her basic questions about you know, biology and genetics. And, you know, she, she indulges my curiosity. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the, the short answer is probably just more science. Wow, that's, that's really awesome. Your hobby would be to read textbooks. Nice. Uh, pretty much. <laughs> All right, yeah, next question we have is from uh, Colin. You want to take it away? All right, I'm uh, Colin from Oakland. So how I was looking up, uh, you you started a company, Octomatic, mm -hmm. and was it just you and your brother that started it, or did you have mentors, or like how did you do everything? So like how that happened? Yeah. Uh, um, well, um, we actually, uh, or what happened was, um, my brother and I, uh, we started to start a different company uh, altogether uh, called Shepa, after the Irish for Shah. Uh, and uh, uh, two other guys uh, uh, from the UK started Octomatic. Um, and after, a couple of months after they started, we then, uh, they'd been funded by YC, and we decided to merge. And so kind of Shepa became part of Octomatic. Um, and then we kind of worked on that together un until the company was acquired. But that's sort of how that happened. And you, you know, you might wonder, okay, but like, you know, one day you were not working on a company, and then you know, the next day you were. Like, kind of, you know, how did that? Uh, and part of it was uh, when I started college um, uh, in 2006. Uh, so I guess now a long time ago. Um, that fall, uh, um, I, I was friends with uh, Aaron Swartz, who some of you are probably familiar with. Um, and he was working with the Reddit guys. Uh, Reddit was uh, a pretty young company at that point. I think it was two-ish years old or so. Uh, and, and he'd become a co-founder there. Um, and um, uh, then Reddit was acquired in, I think, October or November of 2006. Uh, and, you know, I, like I used to go for dinner with Aaron and, you know, now somehow this company that was really closely involved with had you know been acquired, and that just seemed like such a huge deal to me. Uh, and, and also, I thought, I mean, even though Aaron was super smart, that like you know he wasn't some kind of you know mythic godlike figure. You know, he's just sort of on some level another human. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe we could build a technology company as well. Uh, and uh, and so in January or February the next year, John, my brother, and I started, decided to start a company together. But I suspect if I hadn't known Aaron or if Reddit hadn't been acquired then I think we probably would not have. It's pretty crazy. If you look at a lot of like these like huge companies now and you track them back, there's always like so many connections that like you would never guess they were there. It's like people are around each other. I guess it makes sense because like you're inspired by each other. Uh, totally. No, I think uh, uh, again, uh, something my friends and I often talk about is um, the uh, small group theory of history, that like books are all about people, uh, but actually the kind of the um, animating sort of um, dynamics are so much uh, more about, I think, groups than individuals. Uh, and, you know, I don't know that, say, anyone around, you know, the YC community, for example, is themselves, you know, all that kind of singular, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're all special people, don't get me wrong, but, like, uh, you know, I think, you know, the, the YC story is much more a story of a kind of scene uh, than it is a story of, you know, particular individuals. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think kind of anyone trying to... Um, to you know, uh, understand it all needs to be writing about, in a sense, a community. And if you, you listen to Alan Kay, he says the same thing, that, like, um, uh, you know, he obviously, you know, um, was part of the group that uh, helped invent, you know, the GUI and, indeed, Smalltalk and a whole bunch of these sort of really foundational technologies. Um, but what he talked, I mean, obviously, he's very impressed by a lot of the people he got to work with at Park. But, you know, for him, what was special at Park is not that... Um, uh, you know, there were brilliant people there because there's lots of brilliant people in the world and brilliant people are lots of different places, but somehow they find the right kind of community dynamic. Uh, and he attributes a lot of that to being influenced by the ARPA community and the folks who invented the internet. And he attributes that to being influenced by the MIT uh, Rad Lab, uh, where uh, they invented radar during the Second World War. But, but again, if, if you kind of listen to him or, or read his writings, uh, it's much more about sort of, um, uh, again, sort of, uh, community cultures and ethoses and less about, well, you know, in this place, they had someone who is, you know, 5% more brilliant than that place. Uh, and uh, I actually think that's really kind of good news in the sense that um, it, it implies that it's, there isn't like a sort of fixed sum of, um, uh, of sort of, you know, 
uh, uh, kind of human talent or capital in the world, uh, or at least kind of realizable human capital, it's much more about kind of given all the people we have, what are the most effective modes of interaction to unlock that as best we can? Uh, and maybe the ceiling is actually 100x higher than where we currently are. I hope it is. And I hope like the next generation kind of takes it there. Uh, yeah, so our next question is from Melody. You want to take it away? Yep. Hey, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melody. I am the director of Magic here at Hack Club. I am the uh, swiper of stripes and master of cards. And well, uh, in honor of your wonderful company here, we had actually got some of our students uh, on this call to wear or improvise some striped shirts. Uh, and so my question for you is that, uh, in honor, uh, is as young people, what should we be the most excited about when it comes to the future of financial technology? Hmm. I think monetizing through the internet is just a huge deal because, um, for, 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 for two reasons, uh, one, um, you know, on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog, as they say. Uh, and so, you know, one can be a uh, you know of, of any age uh, or you know of any kind of characteristic, uh, and uh, you know you're, you're sort of competing on a much more level playing field. Um, uh, whereas um, you know with most IRL uh, sort of uh, um, you know opportunities, uh, kind of who you are tends to matter a whole lot more. And, and also there tend to be kind of incumbent systems with, you know, rules and procedures and processes. You can't just kind of, you know, leap to wherever you want to be out of the gate. Um, so, so that's one. And then second, uh, just the specialization afforded by the internet. Uh, and so, you know, in a, in a village, you know, you can have a shop that specializes in, you know, ancient Chinese manuscripts. Uh, it's like that there, there's enough demand there to support, you know, a niche that's that, that, that is that narrow. Um, Whereas on the internet, I mean, I haven't looked into this, but you know, I presume there are you know dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands uh, of different retailers that specialize in sort of you know all sorts of different uh, uh, ancient uh, uh, manuscripts of, of you know every every country, um, and uh, and I think that means that you know just we sort of as as individuals we we get to kind of pursue our interests and our passions uh, uh, much more. Um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, with much kind of higher fidelity. Um, and so I, I think kind of the good news for, for young people is it, it's, it's not that, oh, you know, this kind of credit card transaction is getting cheaper or, you know, this kind of blockchain technology is going to take off, though, you know, any of those things could be true. I think it's more that uh, uh, young people have probably never had opportunities to pursue interests and passions in a self-funding way um, uh, to the degree that you know, we, and in particular you, do today. Yeah, I think for sure to the point of accessibility, like the fact that we're all in like Hack Club right now and like talking to you and like being able to interact, like it definitely speaks volumes to like, like the abilities we have now because we're online. So it's definitely really cool that we have that. Uh, um, I agree. Yeah. Our next question from uh, Avni, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Hi, I'm Avni. I am a ninth grader from Connecticut. And you seem to be a pretty philosophical person. So I was wondering who your favorite philosopher is and how their ideas have affected your work and what you do as a whole. In a weird way, I've always found um, sort of philosophy to be kind of too focused on the philosophers. And well, I don't, it may not true. Well, I, I guess the, the separation between, you know, the philosophers and their ideas, right? Um, and, um, you know, I, I think philosophical ideas have been, you know, kind of obviously it's a, just a huge deal for civilization. Um, um, and uh, for, for me, I try to sort of cherry pick uh, sort of across them more. Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's like a single philosopher uh, who, whose ideas I would sort of singularly call out. I mean, I think in general terms, I think the Scottish Enlightenment uh, was uh, was a very big deal, and you know the philosophers of around that, you know, folks like like Hume um, uh, or uh, you know Adam Smith himself. His first book was a philosophy book, not a not a, a uh, not an economics book, um, but you know many others besides. Um, uh, and you know, of course, they in turn you know influenced and were influenced by you know people on the continent and you know, folks like Spinoza and so on. Um, 
of contemporary people, um, David Deutsch, uh, I think, again, I don't know that he, he, one would call him or even that he identifies as a philosopher, but I think The Beginning of Infinity is a really beautiful uh, modern philosophy book. Um, I think Derek Parfish, uh, uh, also uh, from Oxford, um, uh, Reasons and Persons. I, I don't sort of totally agree, but I think it's uh, it's a really interesting kind of modern take on, um, on, on sort of on, on, on moral philosophy. Um, you know, probably the thing that has had the most influence for me, or excuse me, on me though, is um, maybe you would see the Scottish philosophers even as kind of um, as sort of downstream of, uh, of Francis Bacon. And again, I don't know that he, was, that he was a philosopher per se, but just the notion that uh, the kind of human progress is possible and important. Uh, and, you know, the, the, those were not obvious to most people through history uh, that we, you know, the, the world can be understood. Uh, if we come to understand it better, uh, we will be able to kind of improve our circumstances. Uh, and that doing that is, is you know, of, um, there's a kind of imperative there. Uh, and, you know, that, that, that's very simple. And, you know, I think kind of, you know, having collectively realized that it doesn't sound like that big a deal, isn't that super obvious? Uh, but uh, I think it's kind of very interesting to trace through over a couple hundred years how, you know, we as a, as a sort of society came to internalize that. And in a sense, I think we haven't internalized it, you know, enough uh, in, in the, you know, I think we should be kind of more obsessed with uh, how do we both generate and better distribute kind of progress uh, and, and, you know, furtherance of knowledge uh, uh, than we are. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I think also the recognition that sort of, you know, the, the, the importance of liberty and autonomy uh, and, you know, the kind of the, the just the, the, and, and the equality between individuals. Again, that kind of is, you know, it's now the water in which we swim. And so it, it feels kind of obvious, but, you know, for, for most of human history, really not clear at all. People would not have agreed. Uh, and, you know, I think there were always pressures to, you know, society can um, sort of choose different points on the spectrum in terms of to what degree to be reason about sort of, you know, collective interests or, or you know, the interests of groups and so on. And to what you know, degree do we do we think about the uh, the sort of the primacy uh, of the individual as kind of the, the unit of analysis? And I think it, it really respecting the, the the sort of primacy of the individual is um, is again just something I've been very influenced by. Sorry, that was not a short answer to your question. I apologize. I think it's actually coming like particularly more important now, especially as we consider like contact tracing and like where you sort of find that balance in terms of like privacy and progress. So. Right. I think definitely it's be, going to become more important in a couple months ahead. Um, yeah, so right now we're coming at like 15 minutes left, and it was pretty fast. Um, so we have like a ton, a ton of questions coming up. So we're going to try and go as fast as possible. So if you guys have any like quick, like rapid lightning questions, um, there was one like everyone's asking the Slack, so I'm going to bring it up, and then we'll sort of head through them. Um, so Patrick, everyone wants to know, is it tabs or spaces? <laughs> um, uh, as I'm sure most folks in the Slack know, the correct answer is spaces. <laughs> Uh, I think it's some divide there, but <laughs> right. Theo, you want to take it away? Yeah, spaces is the right answer. Um, so hi, Patrick. Uh, I'm Theo. I'm 16. I'm from Boston. Um, and I've been working for Hat Club for the past two years. So uh, you have the power to change one uh, part of U.S. policy or law, big or small. What would it be? Well, I was on a, a call this morning, actually, about U.S. criminal justice reform. And uh, that's um, that's something that I think is very obvious to all of us that needs kind of uh, a huge reform. Uh, and um, uh, I'm not yet sure, I haven't kind of dug into it deeply enough yet to you know have confidence on what the specific change would be. But I think that the best change in that category, there's probably an extremely strong case for. Uh, the, the other thing that I would consider is, um, you know, if, if you just look at the kind of the, the tonnage uh, of uh, U.S. policy over time, like the length of the code of federal regulations, or indeed sort of uh, at the state level as well, or, or, or you know, t total number of pages in uh, all enacted congressional bills and so on. You know, all of those are increasing super linearly um, and not quite monotonically, but but you know, largely monotonically. Uh, and that that, that just, I mean, it feels like a system in disequilibrium. Uh, and again, I don't know what the kind of way to 
correct that is, but I guess I would think about what missing, I mean, obviously the, the, the founders of the U.S. did a you know, tremendous job in, in many regards in terms of you know, um, setting the country up for success, uh, but it feels like, you know, they didn't, um, uh, that, 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 you know, <laughs> um, uh, that what the uh, equilibrium state of the legislative and regulatory process processes should be is something they, they, they didn't really solve. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's becoming sort of more apparent, uh, over time. So, so maybe a meta change in that category. Cool. Thanks. All right. Yeah. We're going to turn over to Emma. You want to ask your question? Hello. My name is Emma. I'm 14 years old and I live near Chicago. Um, my question is what inspired you to start Stripe and how did you identify the need for it? As a teenager, I, I um, built all these websites, uh, and I, I realized one day that I'd never added payments to any of them. I was like, "Well, why is that?" Uh, and it just goes, "Oh, you got to go and you know figure out how to get a merchant account. You have to like mail some stuff and fax some stuff." And it wasn't even like really clear, you know. I, 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 this is kind of hard to describe, but there were a lot of sort of different kinds of companies in the space, and it wasn't even clear to me which kind of company I should be working with. Uh, and then I, I built um, an app. That sort of copied Wikipedia on the iPhone, and not long after the iPhone came out, and so kind of like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and you could you, know, you could read it, read it without internet access. Uh, and then when the App Store came out, uh, like uh, so, I wrote that uh, on a um, on a, uh, on a jailbroken iPhone because at the time there was no SDK, and then the SDK came out in the App Store, uh, and uh, and so then um, I published in the App Store, and uh, it started to you know sell fairly well. Like it paid for I don't know, a semester or two of college, and and uh, and I was like, man, you know. As soon as there was an app store, I started actually selling software, but I never sold anything before then. And I was kind of, again, trying to think through why is that? And I realized again, I just, like in the app store, literally you could just like select from a, um, from a dropdown, uh, uh, what, you, you know, what price you want to sell the app for. It could be free, it could be $5, you know, whatever. And I was like, man, you know, why aren't payments kind of on the rest of the internet that's straightforward? And so in a sense, that dropdown inspired Stripe. Thank you. It's sort of like the picture perfect idea of like seeing a problem and you're like, I'm actually going to solve this instead of just sitting here. So it's, it's kind of perfect. Yeah, well, as, as someone said, you know, many of you probably heard the term, you know, yak shave, you know, where you go to, um, you know, fix one thing and you go to, you know, fix something else and so on. And, you know, soon enough, you're, you're, you're seven layers deep. And so uh, a friend of mine called Stripe, you know, the ultimate yak shave. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, we're going to turn over to Adriano now for the next question. You want to take it away? Okay. So my name is Adriano. I am 16. Uh, I lead a hack club in Brazil. And my question is, what do you prefer, uh, dark or light mode? And my editor convinc uh, configured uh, to, to use a dark theme. Uh, so, um, uh, like, I don't know, re reading, like, uh, you know, turning the whole operating system into dark mode, it always feels, I don't know, it kind of puts me to sleep. Uh, but, you know, when doing serious text editing, uh, always dark mode. <laughs> Yeah, I think unlike the spaces, you're definitely much more in the, the popular vote for Act Club right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, maybe that redeems me slightly. <laughs> We're going to turn it over to Elizabeth. You want to ask your question? Elizabeth? Yeah, hi, Patrick, and thank you for so much for being here. Um, I'm Elizabeth. I'm 16, and I'm from Maryland. And my question for you is, how does Stripe, like as a leader of Stripe, how, um, how do you deal with competition, for example, with PayPal, and how do you stand out and just handle the competition. This, this always sounds, and when I heard it in the past, I always thought it sounded uh, like a cop-out answer. Um, but mostly it's by not. Uh, mostly it's by focusing on our customers and uh, it, like <laughs> basically we, we can identify deficiencies in Stripe in two ways. We can either compare ourselves with our competitors and be like, okay, you know, where are they better you know, than we are? And, and let's go kind of solve that. Or we can just go listen to our customers and you know, they'll tell us what you know, the deficiencies in their eyes are. You know, those could be kind of current customers or you know, potential customers. Um, and basically the customers, excuse me, the deficiencies our customers are telling us about are just much more likely to be relevant in the short term than the sort of potentially relevant deficiencies uh, when we kind of benchmark ourselves against our competitors. Like if we don't hear it from our customers, you know, then maybe it just doesn't matter. You know, maybe some other company is better or something than us, but if our customers don't care, then you know, who cares? Um, so, uh, we, we, we don't tend to focus on them very much. And the other thing that's often not apparent from the outside is, is sort of the degree to which different, um, you know, sort of 
niches, and I guess back to our, our kind of pre previous conversation about you know selling ancient manuscripts, um, is the degree to which uh, uh, sort of a market that looks kind of homogeneous from the outside is, is actually you know, much more different when you start to kind of dig into it. And like you know, for example, you can imagine look, someone looking at programming languages from the outside and be like, well, you know, why are all these programming languages sort of competing with one another? Uh, and you know, on the one hand, they kind of are, and like you know, maybe you know, Python versus Ruby, you know, there, there's certainly some competition there, but like you know, Go versus uh, versus Java versus uh, JavaScript. Uh, versus Python versus Mathematica, you know, they're all actually most useful for, you know, quite different kinds of things, right? And so kind of similarly with Stripe versus PayPal, you know, if you if you want to send $20 to your friend, to your friend, then PayPal is actually a much better product than Stripe. Like we, we just really don't optimize for that use case. Um, but if you're trying to build, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, an e-commerce website or, or, or something, you know, like a, a, a SaaS service, say, then I think Stripe is a way better fit. Uh, like we have, you know, all these rich APIs and dashboards and analytics and all the rest that people just doesn't have. It's not that like ours are better. People just literally does not have them. Um, so, uh, so, so uh, again, I think that often products are actually in somewhat less competition uh, than they might seem. But, but the kind of the, the real answer day to day is that we were always kind of beating ourselves up that we're you know not moving fast enough or doing enough to, to serve and solve our users' needs. Uh, and then you know, every now and again, we'll maybe you know look at a competitor's website, but it's 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 you know not just secondary; it's you know, a distant tertiary consideration. It's kind of funny. There's like all the other competitors in like a wrestling rink, like fighting back, thinking what the consumer wants, and you just go like straight to the consumer. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Go right to the source. All right. So we do have uh, just a couple minutes left. And we want to respect your time. Um, so we have two more questions left. Um, so Lachlan, you want to take it away? Hi, Patrick. I'm Lachlan Campbell. I'm a 19 year old hack clubber from central Pennsylvania. Do you think capitalism and solving climate change are compatible or will capitalism always eventually induce climate change? Um, I think that capitalism is, I mean, capitalism is just a decentralized way of, um, satisfying, uh, preferences, uh, and uh, incentivizing behaviors. Uh, and I think that such a decentralized kind of incentive mechanism and, and sort of, uh, um, an information propagation system is going to be required if we're going to solve climate change, uh, or certainly if we're going to solve climate change, you know, while also preserving acceptable standards of living. Um, you know, capitalism enables us to allocate capital to the things that are super important. Uh, and, you know, Stripe's uh, funding of carbon capture technology is a kind of capitalistic act. Um, and what we need is, um, uh, well, the, 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 the kind of the thing that I suspect will be required is, you know, uh, economists sometimes talk about Pigouvian taxes, uh, which are, you know, actions we take in society can create an externality uh, where, uh, you know, if I'm, um, you know, playing my music super loud, uh, you know, that that you know harms others in, in a way that's kind of, um, um, uh, you know, I, I reach some benefit, but but there's, there's a kind of a broader harm, uh, and uh, I, uh, and so one way of solving that is you can tax behaviors. Uh, that, uh, that create these, um, these these sort of costly spillovers, uh, and I think we will need that and need more of that than we currently have to solve climate change. Now, I don't know that uh, I think there was some complexity to the carbon tax because you always kind of have to worry of like, well, will the activity that generates the carbon just move to a different country? Uh, uh, and and so it's 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 not entirely obvious. But I think, for example, a global carbon tax. Uh, uh, you know, if uh, such a thing were possible, uh, would, would almost certainly be a good thing. So yeah, I, I think we'll need kind of some changes to the incentive structure like that. Uh, but uh, in, in, in as a general matter, I think um, we in fact need capitalism uh, uh, if we're going to develop and fund uh, and incentivize the creation of the technology that will enable us to live prosperous lives uh, while not ruining the planet. Yeah. It's definitely like a balance act because we want to like incentivize progress, but also do it in a way that's conscious. And I think it's like, especially in Stripe, what you guys are doing, it definitely shows that balance. Um, so yeah, we have uh, one last question uh, from Zach Lada, founder of Hack Club. So uh, it's been super awesome having you and I'm going to turn it over to Zach for the last question. Uh, you did a very nice job moderating. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Patrick, I just have to say, um, I, I think I speak on behalf of every Hack Club when I say we are just tremendously, tremendously grateful for you giving your time 
Um, so I have a question for you. Um, I, I asked this uh, to, to Elon Musk, and we had him on an AMA, uh, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in your thoughts on this. Um, so, so say when you got on this call, say you didn't actually get on this call, say you suddenly find yourself teleported back to 500 BC, and you don't know how you did it, but somehow you became dictator of the world. Now, there's a, there's, there's a little bit more here. Um, so you, you realize that you're dictator of the world, you realize you retain all of your knowledge when you're teleported back, but you also realize that you were on one of three identical Earths, and in 2,520 years from now, there's going to be a great war between these three Earths, and only one Earth is going to survive. The, the question is, what do you do as dictator of the world in the year 500 BC to best increase your Earth's chance of survival? <laughs> now, there's, there's three kind of important constraints in this. The, the first is that, again, you retain all the knowledge you retain today. You can start anywhere you want, and you can assume that you speak the local language. But you can't bring anything back with you. Second, um, you are dictator of the world, but it is 500 BC, and you're limited accordingly. Who knows if you say something, if folks on the other side of the world are going to hear it by the time you die. And that brings me to the third constraint, which is that you are going to die. You only have the rest of your life to get your plans in motion. You can assume that you're not going to get any crazy diseases from being teleported back. So you have the rest of the normal lifespan. Um, and the war is inevitable. You can assume three Earths go in a black box, only one comes out. Diplomacy is not an option. So what do you do? I think you'd kind of have to start a religion um, uh, in that, uh, like, everything else feels too fragile. Uh, like, what can last over that kind of time scale? Um, uh, I mean, r religions have, have sort of shown that they can. Uh, and, um, and, and you know, if one kind of really zooms out and looks at uh, as religions as um, sort of a way for us to sort of create an, a, a value system or an ethical system or a belief system or whatever, uh, I think you probably want to ask the question of what beliefs would um, maximize the probability that we can both develop the kind of technologies, but also have the broader you know, cohesion and, and coordination, all those things that, that sort of will serve us best in this uh, you know, 2,500 year hence world. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, but you said I have a lifetime to figure it out. Uh, so, um, uh, and of course you are, it is 500, you know, uh, uh, or it is two and a half thousand years ago. And so, um, uh, you know, you're pretty limited in terms of, you know, what the other avenues might be. I mean, you know, you could, you could try to start, you know, uh, at the iron age or something, but, uh, that, that's why, you know, a a whole lot of work, and B, even if you succeed, uh, it's not clear that you know that, that necessarily advances you that much. You know, maybe everyone's inevitably going to discover the Iron Age. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I, um, I, I, I think you'd want to start a religion. Amazing, cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. I, I mean, this has just been such a fantastic hour, and, and we are all so grateful. Um, no, these, yeah. these are, these are uh, wonderful questions. Uh, uh, you all are uh, a phenomenal community. Uh, and, uh, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me.